Welcome to everybody who's joining us. Um, we've got a great day of talks with great artists and thinkers today. And I'm particularly honored um, that Anthony Davis is here to speak with us. Um, this is presented by the Next Festival of Emerging Artists. And this is a festival uh, dedicated to uh, early artists, early career artists. Um, and we are in the middle of a four week festival presenting great thinkers, great artists for you. Um, and today, uh, it's such a pleasure to introduce Anthony Davis. I had the pleasure to study with him a little bit um, as a composer. And I was just, I have really fond memories of it. And it was really pivotal to who I am as a musician. So um, I'm grateful to all of you for joining in. Uh, and I will hand it right over to Anthony. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good to good to meet with you. Um, yeah. Well, today I was going to talk a little bit about my engagement with opera, and I guess I've been most known for my for for composing opera. And uh, I'll get I'll get into some of the reasons why I became an opera composer and why opera was so appealing to me as a composer. Um, in, in, a, in a second, I was uh, I was I first had the idea that I would write an opera that opera would be the, the vehicle for me when I was in high school in Italy in 10th grade. I was in uh, Torino, Italy for 10th grade. And uh, I went to this extraordinary school and uh, had, a, had his teacher, Charles McKay, who was, uh, had come over to Italy to become a priest, go to North America College, but he fell in love with a woman. So he decided the priesthood wasn't for, wasn't for him. And so he ended up teaching English and started a philosophy class in, at the, the American school in Torino. So I, I was in the philosophy class and I think there were only, you know, there were maybe 50 kids in the whole school. So it was a very small school. And uh, in the philosophy class, we were introduced to a lot of ideas of existentialism, you know, starting with Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, you know, just Sartre and other things. But uh, Nietzsche's work really, really, uh, spoke to me, and I was really interested in the idea, uh, his idea, and uh, we read the essay, Birth of Tragedy, which deals with, um, uh, it was, it's the early kind of Nietzsche, in which he, he was still favoring Wagner, he later would repudiate Wagner in later essays, but, but uh, in this one, he was talking about the idea of opera being the I ideal drama, and opera being, containing both the Dionysian and the Apollonian, the Apollonian being the god of structure and form, of course, the sun god, and Dionysus, of course, Dionysus, of course, being you know uh, the much more the about the the passionate and the emotional and the visceral, and uh, uh, and he, he talked about it being in the spirit, what he called it, in the spirit of revolution, and so this really spoke to me as a tenth grader, and I began to th I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, he wasn't really describing German music. He was describing to me the potential of what American music could be that could combine both the improvised and the composed, the, the music of the African diaspora as well as the European. And, and that from that synthesis, you could create something very exciting. So, so uh, that sort of gave me the directive for what I would wanted to eventually accomplish as a composer to, to create works and particularly in opera that would represent that. Um, uh, so, but it took many years before I could, would undertake my first opera. I, was, I went to Yale, uh, Yale University and I studied, uh, uh, initially I was a philosophy major and then I became a music major later. And uh, uh, I, was, I took, was taking a 19th century music class and it turned out it was taught by Robert Bailey. So it ended up being about, mostly about Wagner and so I was introduced to Wagner's operas. Um, and I was, I was, first I was really upset because I'm a pianist and I said, well, what happened to Chopin and Brahms and Beethoven and, you know, and everything. But, uh, but I, was, I was intrigued by, by the opera and I started writing parodies of some of, of a Wagner, you know. Um, do I was, then I was, had the idea, I was writing suites, like sort of along the lines of Duke Ellington suites, you know, of, but usually based on science fiction novels. So I wrote one based on the left hand of darkness, one based on Dune, 
you know, I saw a number of different science fiction books. So my left hand of darkness sweep, I, I, when I, when I was, when I did the premiere with my band, I had, I had a list of all the light motifs in the piece, you know, that, that would recur, you know, what it went and, and the meaning of each motif. It was kind of a par meant to be a parody of Wagner in a way, but uh, you know, the kind of glossary of light motifs you see in a, in a, in a Wagner opera. So I don't, I'm not sure my teacher thought it was so, as funny as I did, but anyway, uh, so I, that was that was a, that was an exciting exciting to create, and um, so that was my beginning of building toward the idea of creating opera. Um, and then uh, when I moved to New York after my time at Yale in 1977, uh, I became involved and heavily involved in the in the scene at the Public Theater in New York. And I did uh, worked with a lot of uh, music for theater, uh, including uh, doing the piece where the Mississippi meets the Amazon, which was a piece by Anasaki Shange and Talani Davis and Jessica Hagedorn and uh, David Murray, uh, Michael Gregory Jackson and I wrote the music for it. And so, so this is a production that ran for maybe uh, two or three months at the public theater. And uh, so I began, I was involved with a lot with the poetry scene in New York. And I, 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 I did performance with Zaki as well as my, and mainly with my cousin, Talani Davis, who was, uh, we, we, so I wrote a lot, I had a lot of music that went along with her poetry. So she would recite the poetry and I would play the piano. And so it became a whole thing. Um, and, and it was the, during the whole period where they, they were talking about choreo poems, poems that, that would, would be recited, that were, were also with music, et cetera. So, um, so that was, so that was in a way a great introduction into, the, into my thinking and developing my thinking about opera. Then the next stage was doing music. I did a lot of music also for dance. Uh, I worked with Laura Dean, uh, Melissa Fenley, uh, the Jose Limon dancers. So I, I did a lot of work of, of writing music for dance. And I felt that very helpful because one thing that's underestimated in composing for opera is that you have bodies on stage that are moving. You have moving bodies. They've got, so that the music has to compel the bodies to move too. So that's something that's a lot lost sometimes in, uh, in modern opera, the sense of also uh, how rhythm, particularly rhythm can, can uh, excite drama and create drama. So, um, and this goes back to, uh, so I was very interested in this idea of rhythmic drama and rhythmic drama coming, uh, I think some of the influence of, of gamelan music, uh, Indonesian music, you know, being exposed to that. Uh, I, I was very, very much influenced by those ideas of, of creating a rhythmic structure that was, that would in a way also create a dramatic structure. So the points of, points of convergence, you know, with, with polyrhythms, et cetera, could be a point of dramatic conversion, convergence as well. And so that was a, uh, that was a, way, that was a, a technique that I began to develop. Uh, and yeah, you could see here in X and, and uh, certainly later my operas like Under Double Moon, which was really based on that, um, that principle. So the, all those things helped me and prepare myself for, for my first opera. Um, uh, my, and, the first opera was I, I decided to do was to uh, came out of, came about because when I, I did, my brother was involved in a production of a play called El Haj Malik about uh, Malcolm X and he played the role of Malcolm X in the play and uh, so I went to several performances of it and uh, I went backstage to talk to him and he, and he came was very excited he said well you know you should do a musical about Malcolm X. So I said, no, 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 not musical. I mean, what are you going to have the dancing fruit of Islam? What is that? You know, so, so I thought it would be better to do, I said, no, this is an opera. It's a, it's a, tra uh, Malcolm is a tragic hero. And so, uh, so in Malcolm, I found that tragic hero in a way, way, and I, sort of going back to the Wagner model, you know, kind of the Siegfried model, you know, someone who goes through incredible uh, transformation, uh, you know, Malcolm through the name changes going from Malcolm X, Malcolm Little to Detroit Red to Malcolm X to El Haj Malik. So the, all those, the, all those were markers in, in terms of when we destructured the opera, each act was a name change. So, so, uh, so when, 
Mary MacArthur from the kitchen approached me and asked me if I had any ideas for opera because they were interested in trying to commission opera. I said, oh, of course, I like to do Malcolm X as an opera. So, so that's, that's how it started. And, um, and I, I actually, I did a radio interview talking about the idea that I wanted to do this opera. And Marjorie Samoff from the American Music Theater Festival heard, heard my interview and said, well, could you do the opera in four months or something? It was like, I was in December, she heard the interview and she said, well, can you do it in June? Fine. Which is ridiculous. Uh, of course, being naively, I said, oh, of course I can get, I can do the opera by June, you know, sure. And not realizing it was a three act opera it was, and the music was two hours and 45 minutes long, it ended up being. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I started to work on the opera and I actually did the first act orchestrated for a 10 piece ensemble, which was kind of my own group at the time. And uh, so we were able to do the first act and then act two, scene one with piano. So as a workshop, which was a great first step for the opera. And it was, uh, you know, very interesting process. I didn't know then that you had to write a piano vocal score. So I just wrote the whole score, right? So then I had to have, I, because I was still composing, I said, I, said oh, I had to get someone to do a piano reduction of what I would, what I had done. So it was, it was really funny. So, uh, so, but, but, but eventually we did that. And then a year later, we were able to do the whole opera uh, in Philadelphia. And then a the year after that, the official world premiere at New York City Opera in 1986. So the selection I like to play first is Malcolm's aria. Uh, this comes at the end of act one, it's act one, scene three. And uh, it's a kind of a very uh, interesting scene, I'll explain it. Malcolm appears alone, handcuffed under a glaring light. A chair sits stage center. He seems to be talking to interrogators, maybe in the shadows, maybe not there at all. So and what, what this is is an interrogation, but you don't hear the questions. All you hear is, is his reply and his replies and what they expect. So this is Malcolm's aria from uh, X, Life and Times of Malcolm X.
Great. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess we're cutting out on my thing a little bit sometimes. Sorry for that. But um, you can get, kind of get an impression. Um, also, uh, in this piece, it's a really expression of Malcolm's rage. And that's something that, I, that was very important for me to represent, you know, uh, in Malcolm. Uh, and, and the idea of, I mean, when you, I'm using that 5 4 rhythm with the strings, uh, it's sort of the, this idea of this kind of pounding sense of the, the outrage that he feels and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, his, 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 his despair after his, his father's been murdered and his mother has been in, uh, uh, institutionalized. So, and uh, he has turned to, you know, become a hustler and, and uh, robbed a jewelry store and now is in prison. So, the, so, so uh, this, this brought me on a whole path of the, this idea of also, uh, I was very interested in politics growing up and uh, very interested in, in the, you know, the, at, when I was actually, when I was in Italy at the same time, I was really becoming more interested in uh, black nationalism and, and a political, in the political sphere and thinking about, uh, uh, you know, what might possibly my role in that could be and, and to, and struggling with my identity, uh, uh, the idea of being an African American and what that meant. Uh, I, I had grown up in a mostly white community in State College, Pennsylvania, which is my brother and I were the only African Americans in the, in the school. Uh, so it was very much, uh, uh, so, so, so we, you know, so, so, so the, this feeling of identity was something that was very, I had to earn, I had to feel I had to, to become a part of. So in Italy, at the same time as I was beginning to compose, I also was, and beginning to, and read all these things about philosophy, I was also beginning to improvise and, 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 and study jazz. And that was very important to, important to me. Uh, I, I, when, before I going to Italy, I was a completely, I was a classical pianist. And uh, so uh, uh, as, a, as a joke, some a friend of my fight, my dad's gave him a record, Monk, Thelonious Monk in Italy, Monk in Italy. And uh, my dad can relate to, to the music too much, but I loved Monk's music. And uh, to me, he was the window, the window into a whole different world of music. Uh, Thelonious, first of all, Thelonious Monk was a great composer as well as a pianist. And he had his, and, every, and there was nothing you could separate. You couldn't separate the improvisation from the composition. Because what he, what he did was uh, his style of improvising was so unique as well. And uh, so I remember learning the whole record. I listened to the record over and over again and started playing it on the piano and, and learning, learning Thelonious, Thelonious, Monk's, Thelonious Monk's music by ear. And this, this began a whole odyssey, you know. So when Italy, they had these record stores, where you could listen to records and uh, on a, records were coming on a conveyor belt. And you could listen to, you know, five or six albums before buying one. So I would listen to Coltrane, you know, records and uh, Cannibal Adderley records, Miles Davis records, uh, Monk records. And I was, I, I would like every day I would listen to about five records and pick one. And so I was, you know, so I began to really understand and learn about, about my, my, you know, and about African-American music, about my, what would be, what would be the, the, the roots of my music. Um, and then as I be began to progress as composer, I was, I always, I never left the idea that I, that, uh, and I never tried to separate uh, the improvised tradition from the composed. I was very interested in uh, bringing that energy, that music from uh, you know, particularly that music that really moved me in the 60s, you know, Coltrane, Miles, uh, uh, Winton Kelly, you know, Bill Evans, I can go across the board about, about that music, you know, that I began to really understand and bringing that, bringing that aesthetic into what I was doing as well. Um, in this aria, for example, in the beginning, when you hear the clarinet solo, it's a, the clarinet is actually improvising, it has, has some notes that that they that play to open the improvisation and close the improvisation but i wrote jd perrin who is the clarinetist in it his idea deal was to he had to develop this material on his own over this pedal just to you know the b pedal with a b and a c sharp and the and and uh and so uh it was very funny when he first started doing he asked me for the whole score of the opera so i gave him the whole score of x 
And so he started improvising. He was do, and it was in fact doing a whole overture of the opera. <laughs> <laughs> when he improvised, I said, J.D., don't, please don't do the overture on, in the solo. Just play, you know, play what you play, you know, thinking about what the challenge of the moment, what's happening in the moment, what's happening on stage, what's, you know, not so much, you know, a reflection of the whole thing. I didn't need a summation of the whole opera. So, so, so that, that, then that freed him to, to explore other things. But I, I love working with improvisers. I love giving them the space to, to improvise and to be so that, every performance of my operas is unique. I mean, it's not, the, the improvisation is something that's embedded in, in, the, in the structure of the operas that I create. And so I like to leave space, particularly for the uh, instrumentalists. In a few cases for the singer, you know, with Thomas Young, for example, who was a, a great jazz singer, as well as a great opera singer, I could, I could have him scat and have him do other things as well. So, so that, that's, that's something that, uh, I was, I, was, I was very important to me. Um, and I, I like to think of music not having boundaries. I don't, I don't go, I don't go into the genre game, you know, of, you know, is this, you know, Afri African, Cla African American classical music or whatever, all these labels, et cetera, et cetera. I think that to me as an African American at this juncture, you know, I think I, I can speak to, to a lot of influences across, across the spectrum of music and that, that you can create your own identity built on built on music that that touches you, makes you, and moves you. You know, so that's that's what would be my, my message to you. So uh, this is this uh, X was the beginning of the uh, of my engagement in opera, and also with this idea of of particularly uh, the political purpose of looking at Black Lives. I mean, now now we talk about Black Lives Matter, which is, I think is very important to me. But I think I, I even back then, I was something that that I was thinking about in terms of, of of what and when I presented opera was to to present our version of history, to to revisit history and look at it from an uh, almost a, what I would say an Afrocentric point of view. So uh, that carried on into other operas I did. So my uh, fourth opera I did uh, Under the Double Moon was my second, and then Tanya. But my fourth opera, Amistad, was about the Amistad Rebellion and the subsequent trial of, of the Amistad. It was done at the Lyric Opera of Chicago in uh, 19, 1997. And uh, actually the opera came out just before the movie, the movie, the Spielberg movie. And actually Spielberg stole the idea from, from me from, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll believe that story another time, you know, but, but how, how almost I have it became a movie as well but but in the opera um we were we decided to tell the story from the point of view a uh, kind of different different perspective than the kind of master narrative that that Spielberg represents uh we we, we tried to we we included some African deities in the opera including the trickster god you know that in Yoruba would be Eshu and uh, then also the goddess of the waters, who is Yemaya, you know. So, so I was I was interested in in doing that because I wanted to t tell it from the almost an African perspective too, you know, to give it give it a different dimension than 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 the normal telling of the story. And one of the subtexts of it was how the trickster came to America, how the trickster came to America. And this is interesting because in um, when the Amistad Rebellion happened in the late 1830s and into the early 1840s was actually also the beginning of minstrelsy. The first minstrel show, show when Thomas Rice uh, and, the, and the Christie Minstrels began was in 1840. So we, you know, George Wolfe and Talani Davis, my cousin and I thought that was no accident. That this idea of why, why the minstrel show would become the most popular entertainment from you know the 1840s all the way through to the to the end of the century, and then influenced the emergency of uh, you know uh, vaudeville and a uh, number of the popular forms that emerged in the 20th century come exact ag, come come completely from from uh, minstrelsy. I mean, you can see in Porgy and Bess is <laughs> a lot of Porgy and Bess come throughout of minstrel shows too. For even though George George Gershwin tried to put some distance away distance from it. But but the um, but the minstrel show was very funny because it's sort of, one of the messages of minstrel show is the myth of the happy slave, 
the idea that that a slave could be you could be happy as uh, as a slave, and so um, so uh, so I began so so we could kind of unpack this because and it, there was an incredible anxiety in, in around 1840 with with the rise of you know slave rebellions for example the you know the uh, Nat Turner et cetera you know and uh, uh, and so uh, Denmark Vesey in South Carolina so this idea that that slaves would rebel and slaves would were, were up in arms to, to free themselves was uh, a, a fear, a, a primal fear for, for white Americans. And so the minstrel show represented this sort of assuaging this fear saying, oh, well, no, they're, they're happy in slavery to Sambo and, you know, it's like, and, and, and all, all that. So, so, so that was, that was, that was part of what, why we thought, this idea of the trickster coming to America, because the trickster, in a way, this idea of in parroting African American culture, which a lot of you know, like cakewalk stuff and and uh, the minstrel shows, a lot of those things represent parodies of African American culture. In parroting this, they also be it was also the the first stage in the process of America and America's culture becoming fundamentally African, rooted in African culture that. America, particularly America's popular culture, would not exist without African Americans. It's 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 uh, it, it's it, the roots in African American culture is, is, is run deep and long. You know, so so the so that this so uh, so in the, this idea of when when they were trying to parody this, they were they were they were in a way allowing America America was being transformed. America was now no longer an offshoot of Europe. And you, you know, kind of a, a colony of Europe, but now it had its own identity, which was was in large part African as well as European. So this is so so that was that was very important. So so when the trickster comes to America and finds himself on the Amistad, he he decides to to stay because there's so much mischief he can get into in America. So that that was some of the subtext of it. Uh, this aria, which is from Act Two, uh, Scene Six of Amistad, and uh, uh, it's a aria of the goddess of the waters, and she appears kind of as as an answer to the trickster. Um, the trickster, in this first aria in the beginning of the opera, actually calls out to the goddess of the waters because he's he's stranded on this ship, you know, that that's grounded in Montauk, Long Island, and and he's in despair of the trickster. So. Uh, what we decided with the goddess aria was to really tell the story of the middle passage, you know, how, how Africans, the idea of Africans coming to America and all the Africans who were lost in the voyage. So the, the, the goddess is, feels, is, feels in effect, and an and effect has been, uh, uh, she, she, she has been, she, she feels deeply that the fact of seeing these bodies float down to the bottom of the, to the bottom of the ocean and receiving these bodies still still young and still full of vitality, et cetera. So, um, so, so in effect, this is a violation of her. And so that was kind of the idea of, the, the, uh, of, of it. So in the, in, when we did the opera in Chicago, actually there were puppets with, we see kind of bodies and things floating down to the bottom of the ocean with a kind of, uh, 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 dias kind of kind of diorama thing in the in the back and it was interesting in uh when we did it later in Spoleto it became uh she appeared she was a lawyer the goddess and was uh, she looked like Michelle Obama you know coming coming to litigate with the Supreme Court the moral case for about against slavery so this is the goddess of the waters aria uh and uh with Florence Quibar uh singing the goddess uh with the Lyric Opera of Chicago Orchestra from, from a live performance that was later put on CD as well with New World Records. So this is uh, the, uh, the Come As If From the, the Heavens by the Goddess of the Waters.
Oh, 
Hi, yeah, that's uh, that's the Goddess of the Waters aria, and uh, uh, it's kind of has an interesting. Well, thank you. The, the structure and form to it. Um, you know, you hear the opening in you know that instrument with the flute and the clarinet. Uh, then uh, uh, and it settles into into A minor uh, with that. Um, and it's interesting because I one of the things I, I think about with tonal music is is when I use tonality, I try to define the tonality by its dissonance, rather than A minor being defined as A you know A C E E G, e, G or something like that. I think of it as the tension between B and C and the E and the F you know. So it kind of defines the uh, the Aeolian minor you know is defined by the minor second interval. So so you hear the collapse of the, moving from the extreme registers from the A and the B collapsing to the F and the E and then collapsing to the B and the C. So, so that, that, that was the, that was the idea of that. So, so the, the idea of uh, tonality being defined by its tension, the tensions within it. Um, and that was, what gave me a kind of fresh perspective on, on using tonal, the tonal idiom. Uh, and then it kind of moves, you know, moves away from that. It has a series of dances so I began to think about the idea of this when you hear the Austin out, ding, ding, da, 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 that whole thing. I, I, I thought about the swing, the, the movement of the ocean and also the movement of the body. And that, that it's, that in effect, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a dance that, that is happening. That, of course, the influence of my writing so much dance music before. Um, and then uh, the, when it culminates, it gets finally, it, there, there, there are moments that, it does a weird thing where the the, uh, the aria builds up, then it kind of goes back to, into almost a recitative moment, and then back into the aria. I thought it was a way of kind of breaking up the normal structure of arias. Uh, to me, to that would more vividly tell the tell represent the telling the sto this story. Uh, so that sometimes sometimes some things are more intimate and pulled back, and some things are are you know where where she really expressed her rage and her outrage of being by uh, uh, and her violation. That way, it really uh, goes almost over the top. So that so that's that was something that interests me. And I also used of like the light motifs idea. You know, when the motif at the end of the aria, when you hear the ostinato and the uh, at the at the end of very end of the opera is coming from the navigator's aria, which which is earlier in Act Two that uh, basically sets up the navigator just also describing the ocean. So a lot of the times in the opera. The, the music and also the the word in the words they describe the ocean you know ocean is a, almost like a character in it very similar to uh peter grimes with uh you know with benjamin Britten's opera peter grimes which was an influence on this um i have to say the two operas that i listened to most before i did amistad were peter were peter grimes and moses and aaron and moses and aaron because of the relationship of uh the trickster god to Sinke, and uh, and and also I think with uh, uh, Grimes the, the sea interludes and also the the opening chorus uh, and the way he uses tonality different tonalities against each other that's something that that that, that interested me um, and uh, uh, and then also looking at uh, there are other moments in it the tricks the trickster music is very always very rhythmic and, ex and exciting. And, and I wrote that with Thomas Young, definitely in mind. 
So uh, let's see. I have a little time. Uh, may I just play that? This is my last, my my most recent opera, the Central Park Five, and uh, I was fortunate that it won the Pulitzer Prize this year. So uh, and so I'd like to play. Uh, this is Corey's aria, Corey Wise's aria from the Central Park Five. Uh, this is just after he's been released from prison. He's released from prison after th serving 13 years. The other of the five only served seven years in, in uh, juvenile detention, whereas Corey Wise, because he was uh, a, a year older, was, was prosecuted in, in adult court, as an adult and was in adult prison for 13 years. And uh, Macias Reyes, uh, Reyes, Matias Reyes uh, confessed to the crime and they later, with DNA evidence, DNA evidence proved that he was the sole assailant of, of uh, Tricia Miele, who was the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Central Park jogger. And then they were eventually exonerated. But at this point, he's been released from prison. And he has a lot of resentment by the fact, you know, he's been, been, been in prison for 13 years for some crime he did not commit. And also, also, he's thinking about all the time he's lost and all he's lost, how, how do you measure the time and, uh, and, and, and the life he's lost? So this is Corey Azaria from uh, Central Park Five. Mm. Does it hurt more than the love? 
Yeah. So, yeah, that, so that's from uh, Central Park Five and um, uh, wonderful singer Nathan Graner singing uh, the, the role of Corey Wise. Um, and it was, it was uh, really exciting to work on this project. Uh, uh, Richard Wesley wrote the libretto for um, Central Park Five. And um, uh, and it was exciting also that uh, I, we had, I had a chance to meet all of the original five. Um, we, my, the cast of the opera and I uh, were, went to an ACLU luncheon in Los Angeles. And the cast of the Netflix series was there as well. And uh, we met, met all of the five. So, I, so I, that was great to, to, to get to speak with all of them. And, and uh, I think it inspired all the cast, you know, thinking about who they were playing and, and representing on stage. And I, I think of about the Central, Central Park Five is almost the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, of, uh, when Sharon Salam who really got involved politically with, um, uh, it, as an advocate for her son, Youssef and the others. Uh, uh, this, this, this sense of the movement beginning, you know, at that, at that point, you know, with the, the their false incarceration and, uh, and it's, and also it's, it's coincidentally the beginning of Donald Trump's political career as well. Cause Donald Trump exploited the, uh, Central Park Five uh, and, and, uh, through his demonizing them, you know, he, he tried to advance his political, political agenda. And we, we see the results of that today. So I think that that was really important to me to 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 show in the opera, and in general, I I think opera is very very interesting because we we can speak to a lot of things that are going on, you know, and 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 not only to uh, it's not the way a TV drama does or a movie does, because we're, in a way we can look at some of the underlying emotion, some of the things what lies behind it, you know, like in almost an analytical way. And I think think opera is almost uniquely suited to do that, you know, through music. So, so for me, um, uh, in Central Park Five, for example, and and an X and an Amistad, they all not only represented really important political moments in our history, but also the fact that they were cultural moments. There are moments in which, you know, the direction of American culture was was had been fundamentally uh, fundamentally changed. You now, with with Malcolm, we see, you know, all. Uh, Malcolm's life is in, in the autobiography talks about the evolution of jazz, you know, from the forties to the sixties from, from, uh, uh, from the Amistad, we saw the emergence of the, uh, the minstrel show that coincided with it. And so, so this idea of, of, you know, what was, how America was being transformed into it, to a, 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 an Afro-American country. And then we see in, in the Central Park Five, the, this this reaction against what they saw as the 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 hip hop revolution, well, just the the idea of uh, hip hop was moving from the Bronx to Manhattan. So when they were wilding in the park, what wilding was referring to was a song, "Wild Thing" by Tone Loke. You know, it was a popular a popular song during the time. So 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 it so, so it's p the culture and cultural mo these cultural moments are also, also they, all, they, they reflect what's going on in our political world and they go hand in hand. So, so uh, for me uh, in music, I try to, I try to, try to make, try to try for the audience to make, make those connections too. Do you have any, any questions you want to ask? I've seen some questions on chat, so I could, I would li love to answer some of them. Anthony, Anthony, um, just tying right into what you were talking about, um, I think that you're working on a new project. I think that people would be interested in hearing about. Yeah, I was uh, several projects. One, I'm doing a, a Black Lives Matter anthem that I'm doing for Minneapolis. That's going to premiere in Minneapolis in the, in August, in the, toward the middle to the end of August, and uh, with bobbing four with Karen Slack and, and three other singers. Um, and that's when he, so Talani's working on the lyrics now. So as soon as I get the lyrics, I can write the music. So I'm trying to figure <laughs> I'm waiting for that. And then I'm, I, uh, I'm also with, with Talani on uh, Greenwood uh, 1921, which is about the Tulsa race massacre. Uh, and, we, and we already began, she began work on re some research on that. We, uh, and we found, uh, found some very interesting firsthand accounts of what happened in, in Greenwood. And uh, they're they're still uncovering uh, un unmarked graves in uh, Tulsa. They they think there are three new sites that they just discovered. 
So, so it's probably well over 300 people were murdered during that, during that incident in 1921. Yeah, unfortunately, it was just uh, in the news. It's really yeah, too... Similar thing in Wilmington, North Carolina, too, actually. So yeah. there are other places where these things, where there were prosperous African-American, where there was a prosperous African-American middle class, you know, Black Wall Street and Greenwood, but also Wilmington, North Carolina is another example of that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, so uh, you know, the, the white jealousy had no bounds, you know. So, the, the, so they... They always say it's you know something. Oh, there was some someone looked at a white woman or something. They, they, they always use that as the excuse, but the real reason is that you know as they see African American black progress is as a threat to them. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of questions. If you, if you still um, are able to, uh, somebody's asked when working with improvised passages, how much underlying structure do you give the player? Chord changes, a mode, a wit written description. Okay, that's a very good question. That varies according to the style um, and what I'm doing with. You know, sometimes with the more jazz-oriented thing, like for example, streets music and X, I may have chord changes, maybe a blues, or maybe a chord progression of some kind, etc. But most of the time, uh, I think I look at um, improvisation as more developmental. The, I have mo mo motivic information. And and et cetera, and they have and the improvisation is supposed to move from one thing to another. So too often, like improvisation is just used to. It's like you come back to the same thing, you know. So it's like, uh, you know, like you have the the head and the improvise come back to the head. That form always a uh, uh, bug me. So I have the improvisation, and then it comes back, then it moves the moves the music from one place to another. So it's in a way it's a, it functions as part of the developmental structure. Um, and that, that's something I've, I've worked with a lot of the, and a lot of the improvisers I work with uh, have worked with me for, you know, 30 years. So, so that's been, that's been, but we have a, an understanding of, you know, how that fits into the music. And also I write for them. I mean, I, the way Ellington wrote for Johnny Hodges or, or uh, Lawrence Brown or, or Tricky Sam Nanton or Barbara Miley, I, I write for them, so so because I, I know what they like to do and what they well, how and what their voice is, what they want to express in their on their instruments. So that's that's something that that I was always, always have in mind. For with JD, I know for example he loves multiphonics, so I say he does always he has all this stuff with multiphonics he does. So I have to I like to set it up for for him to to explore multiphonics within the context of what what I'm trying to do in the overall form of the music. We had an earlier question about opera, um, which you answered in the chat. But I want, do you want to you want to go back to that, or do you feel like yeah, uh, yeah? We talked about no no, and so, you know some composers who rejected the terminology of opera. I think the also because of the whole European baggage, the baggage of modernism, and, and the baggage of, of the whole tradition of that. I, mean, I understand from that perspective, especially a radical like like Luigi Nono, you know, who's you know you know, is sort of as against the kind of power structure that the opera would represent. For me, it's a little different. I, I think of opera, um, I think my, my role in opera has been subversive in the sense that going into that world and telling stories that wouldn't be told in the, in the opera world and also making the opera and represent uh, uh, you know, sort of my uh, the, a different idea of history, a different concept, and, I, and 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 but I think also it's rev revolutionary in the sense that uh, when I, I go back to my my study of Nietzsche, looking at uh, in the spirit of revolution, so I always think of writing in that spirit, I'm composing in that spirit, but the spirit of revolution for me is also uh, looking at social justice and and the and. Uh, the political sphere and what what we can do as African Americans to to address you know racism et cetera. So that's that's very important to me. It's very uh, very important in, in what I do in opera. Um, and uh, so 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 but but opera I, I I love working with the operatic voice. So so I so I've written like for example you know you heard heard Nathan and you heard also Florence Grivar. It was Eugene Perry was singing. Uh, Malcolm and I've had the good fortune of working with some fantastic singers over the years, 
And uh, I love the sound of the voice. I'm, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not one of those new music composers that like uh, singers with no vibrato, et cetera. You know, I, I, li I love vibrato. I want to hear, I like the physical quality. I like the, when I, when I hear a singer like that, I feel it, feel it, feel it physically when I, when I, when I hear them sing, because it, it, it's something in the acoustic quality of the voice, the idea of being able to project over an orchestra, all those things. And I think there's an emotion, an emotion that I get from that. That I wouldn't get that I, that is that's very different and it's something appealing to me and uh, also you have all these great voices doing porgy and bess and stuff and uh, and uh, and uh, and it's crazy to me because you know it's like um, I mean that's the only opera they get to do and that's 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 horrifying you know because uh, like Queen of the the, the Goss of the Waters is for a Serena voice it's absolutely you know whoever sings Serena should sing this I mean they could sing this. And I think it would be, it'd be, it'd be interesting to, to see that because uh, what, what, what I think of the, the possibility of, because uh, uh, I think the uh, bringing, bringing real stories about our struggle, about the African-American struggle and not some, you know, uh, uh, that, that speak directly to our condition, I think through the power of music, I think has, has great promise and great potential. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, younger musicians, performers, composers right now who are part of the festival and tuning in and, and are really leading the way in terms of um, in terms of politics, in terms of protest. Do you have any uh, advice for young musicians right now at this particular moment in time? Well, yeah, I think it's it's important to be engaged. It's important to uh, I think explore explore all aspects of your identity. You know, don't don't uh, censor yourself. Don't allow yourself to be controlled. And and I think that that's hard as a student. I know, I know. I I mean, when I, I was a terrible student because I fought with my teachers every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I followed my teachers every day because I, I had to fight for my life as a, and my identity. I had to fight for who I was, you know, and, and not surrender that to anyone. So I think that's important. And I understand that when I'm teaching too, because, because I think some of the strongest students are people who, who have their own direction and know what they want to do. And you just, you, you have to help them find it, help them, help them develop it and not necessarily, you know, impose something on them. So, um, and I, uh, and I, that's something, that's just something I think about. Um, Cause I, I mean, I was in constant battles at Yale with my, my, my teachers, I was, it was unbelievable. I mean, I go into music history classes and they say, well, Adolf Sachs's least important invention was the saxophone. I said, no, no, no. I mean, come on, man. You mean, haven't you ever heard Charlie Parker or Lester Young? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, so, you know, so, 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 so I, that's something I, I insisted on and I had to, I had to, to, to sort of present that, you know, um, and then musically, I thought, I, I always felt that, that um, uh, I, it's, I don't have to, in a way, become, become someone else's idea of who I should be. I have to be who I want to be. And that's, that's, that's the, that's the thing I think is, and, and, and you find that you'll have resistance and you'll have things, you know, there'll be, there'll, there'll, there'll be people who want to guide you in a certain way, but you have to be really true to yourself and also realize that, you know, that, that the world isn't just about music. I mean, that you, you have to be, you have to embrace that, the idea of, of what and how, what you do can be meaningful to that, to the world. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I can only speak to my teacher and I, I thought you, I listened to everything you had to say, but that's, that's <laughs> because it was you. I listened to, but it was, a, it was very funny, but, but it, it, but some people come with a, uh, an idea in their mind and you, you all, and you, and you, and you, they have a world, they have a view and they, and, they, and what you have to do, it's, what's interesting is that, um, uh, you have to kind of give them like clues to things that they might, other things they might think about too, but, but, but they have a strong, 
direction of their, of their own, you know, and it's, and it's interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, so that, that's, I always found it fascinating as a teacher too. And then, uh, then off, but I also try to remember when I was a student so I, I can be more sympathetic. <laughs> Uh, we have we have maybe one more question that just um, appeared in the chat. If uh, you spoke about want, waiting for the lyrics to write, is that your general writing process? Is there ever a time you write before you receive the lyrics? Yeah. Well, yes. Early in my career, I did, um, and uh, I wrote some sec some sections of X. I wrote music first. Um, you know, in the actually mecca scene, I had written some of the music first. Um, and it was interesting because I, 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 now when I look at the music, I, 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 I think, I, I, I think it's better, it's much better process for me to work with the words first because they let the librettists have a coherent idea, an idea that makes sense, uh, that makes sense in terms of language, in terms of the story you want to tell, all those things. Uh, and then <clears throat> go through an editing process with the librettist, the writer. Uh, that that also helps that also helps fit into your musical ideas. So uh, that's been sort of my working the way I like love like to work with writers. Uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, you know I, I I will repeat things or uh, expand things at times with my own words to, as dummy lyrics because I need more more music more musical material. Or sometimes a lot of times I edit I I pare down things. And I think that also, I think it's good to have too much, have, have your writer write too much. And then you can pare down from that because I think uh, that gives you more options in, in terms of the you know, musical direction, how you set, set the text. Uh, but I think it's very important to have the text be a, something coherent first. It's very hard to write words to music and have it have the meaning. I mean, a song, it can work pro probably in a song but in an opera, uh, when you're trying to, to 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 tell a story as well, I, it's I think it's less effective. I mean, Gershwin could get away with it with because Ira could write lyrics to anything because he wrote music first, and and Ira was probably the supreme lyricist in terms of setting 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 text, etc. Um, he didn't work with Debose Hayward that way though. Debose wrote the words first, so so it's interesting to to see you know when he when he you know. You know the the, the pieces like uh, you know when Ira can write words to the music, but but generally generally I work the other way around. Um, occasionally, I mean, I've worked with some librettists who are composers as well, like Michael John Lacusa, who did Tanya with me, and Michael Corey, I, who I'm working with now on a, a music theater piece called The Shimmer, and we're working with both of them. Uh, sometimes we I write music first because. They they can they're how they they can put words to music they can they can do that we, and so it's more 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 going back and forth between music and words. Great well thank you so much this has been really really amazing and uh, well, yeah thank I know you. everybody's really grateful and inspired so thanks for doing it congratulations oh, and thanks thank to everybody you. for tuning in. Um, thank you. Yeah we've got lots of other great events coming up hope you can join us and uh thanks again anthony it's really been a, a total pleasure all right well, thank, thanks very much thank, thank you, you. Bye bye